Continuing our series in the Psalms, and I'm a little bit sad to say that this will be my last week in the Psalms. Jason will look at the Psalms next week, and then we'll, we'll be moving on to something else. But I have, I have uh, been encouraged and challenged and blessed by diving into the Psalms, and I hope that you have been as well. Um, it's worth reading again, the first part of Psalm 103. So please follow along um, on the screen or in your Bibles, uh, Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all of your sins and heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children... So the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, for he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord. O oh, my soul, may God bless the reading of his word this morning. And I hope that you can do what Jason suggested we do this morning and let those words sink in. Um, I, we were having a conversation at the Thursday morning uh, prayer group at, at 10 a.m. And you're more than welcome to join us as we pray for our church and our community but we start by looking at a, at a psalm. Jason has been guiding us through psalms in that, in that small group. And I said that Psalm 103 was not only my favorite psalm, but probably my favorite passage in all of Scripture. And I hope that you can let the beautiful thoughts and imagery and truth of that psalm sink in and saturate your soul this morning. Let me ask by... Now let me start by asking you a question. Have you ever received an unexpected gift? Let me tell you about a time when I expected an unexpected, when I received an unexpected gift. It was a laptop computer. My iBook G4, which I got from Acadia Divinity College in 2004, was getting a little bit old. I had to touch the screen, apply pressure to it for it actually to come back into focus. It would go fuzzy. And somehow my parents found out about this 
And they came to our place in Stewiak, where we were living at the time. This was November 2009, so my, my good old iBook G4 was five years old. And my parents flabbergasted me with a brand new MacBook Pro, which I have to this day. And maybe I should say, if my parents are listening, it's five years. <laughs> Just kidding. But I, was, I didn't know what to say. Have you ever received something, like an unexpected gift, and you're just speechless? This was, this was wonderful. I was going to be embarking on, a, on my PhD. I needed a new computer. And it wasn't, just a, it wasn't just a computer. It wasn't some piece of junk from Future Shop that cost $200. This was a really nice and indeed extravagant gift, and for one, I was just very, very grateful. Have you ever received something like that? When we do, our response has to be thanks, one of thanksgiving. Jesus tells, or the gospel writers tell a story of Jesus healing ten men who had leprosy. This really neat story. All of them are healed, and when they realize that they've been healed, one returns to Jesus. And what does he say? Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. In Romans chapter 1, which is known for Paul, Paul's indictment of the Gentile world and their decadence, their extravagances in the negative sense, their sins... We overlook this because we're maybe caught up in some of the more notorious sins that Paul mentions. But do you, did you ever notice that one of the things that Paul says about the Gentile world and their sinful behavior is that they did not give thanks to God? They did not give thanks. Out of all of the things that Paul could mention and does mention... Not giving thanks is one of them. That's pretty incredible. So when we receive something extravagant, when we receive something huge and important, our response should be thanks. And that is what the psalmist is doing this morning. He starts by saying, praise the Lord, O my soul, or bless the Lord, O my soul. We came across the word blessed or blessed in Psalm chap in the first psalm, the first chapter of the Psalms. And I said that that word had the connotations of being happy. Happy is the one who doesn't walk in the way of the wicked. This is a different blessed word. And it means to declare someone the source of a special power. So the psalmist is declaring God the source of something special. And what is the psalmist saying? Bless the Lord or praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. One of the reformers, Philip Melanchthon, he said that to know Christ is to know his benefits. Now, we can take this to an unhealthy extreme, and we can kind of water down discipleship into thinking that it's just all about what Jesus can give me. We don't want to do that. But at the same time, we want to appreciate the benefits of knowing Christ and being known by him. And the psalmist starts with six benefits. And the first three are Negative things, in the sense that they're things that God takes away. In verse 3, he forgives all of your sins and heals all of your diseases and redeems your life from the pit. I love, though, how the psalmist words this. You know, sometimes it doesn't come out in translation. But literally, God is the forgiver of your sins. I think it just drives home a little bit more that this is in God's nature. It's not just something that God does. It's in his nature. He's the forgiver of your sins, the healer of your diseases, the redeemer of your life from the pit. And we can take this 
literally and figuratively. With the literal way, we have to be careful. We have to be careful. Who forgives all of your sins and heals all of your diseases. Ancient people often attributed sickness to sin. There was a direct correlation. If you did something wrong, God punished you by making you sick. Now, Jesus came along and corrected that thinking. It is not automatic. We do something wrong, we are not sick. Jesus did not say that that is the case all of the time. He made that very clear. Uh, Just one example, in John chapter 8, the man born blind. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born this way? And Jesus said, neither. But so that the power of God could be made evident in his life. That being said, when we sin, when we are caught up in a life of sin, sometimes it can't help but affect us physically. The anxiety, the stress, all of that is just put into our lives and it affects us physically. And sometimes it can even bring us down to the depths of despair and physical despair, and our lives might be in danger because of sin. But we need to look at this figuratively as well. When we are in a life of sin, when we disobey God, our lives are, figuratively speaking, sometimes pretty low. And we feel like we are caught in a pit, a slimy pit. But what the psalmist is saying is that God redeems our life from these circumstances. He doesn't leave us there. It's in his character to redeem and to heal and to forgive. And the psalmist gets a little more positive Three good things that God gives. He, after lifting you out of the pit, crowns your life with love and compassion. He satisfies your desires with good things. And the result of this is so that is that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Powerful imagery. Go back to that first line. Crowns you with love and compassion. I told you about a word the last few weeks that the Psalms use over and over again, and it's used throughout the Old Testament. God's covenant, faithful steadfastness, his mercy, his faithfulness. And this is the first of four occurrences of this word in the Psalm. The Psalmist talks about God's compassion. This is a word that is often used of someone in a position of authority who decides to act kindly. Someone who relents from doing what what maybe is deserved and instead shows kindness. Perhaps a king. Perhaps one of the king's ambassadors. And this word's here used of God. He's compassionate with us. He is steadfast in his love and loyalty to us. And it is good, and I would say it's even necessary for us this morning to remember our need of and the reality of God's forgiveness in Christ, as well as God's character. If I can bring in Psalm 130 to help us out. Let me read a line from Psalm 130, verse 3. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Let me ask you, what invigorates you? What just brings you to the next level? Is it going for a run? Watching a a ball game on TV? Maybe jamming with friends? Or a cup of tea? 
you know, different strokes for different folks, right? God's forgiveness is good and renewing. And it is refreshing. And we need to remember that this morning. Because often we have the tendency to dwell on our failures. I was looking for something this week, and I came across something else. Often that happens. But somebody that Christine reads on a regular basis is Ann Voskamp. I mean, you ever heard of Ann Voskamp? She has a great blog and has written some wonderful books. But I, I read a post, and I didn't mean to, but it ties in perfectly to what I'm talking about. I was looking for something else that I know that I heard on her blog or from her books or whatever, and I came across this line. She said, you are not your sin. You are not your sin. You are not your sin. And when God has forgiven us, we need to remember that. If God has taken away our sin, we are not our sin. That is not how God looks on us in Christ. I find that hard to remember sometimes. Maybe you do too. But when God forgives us, we are clean. Let's remember that. How does the psalmist drive home what he's been saying? One of the first things he does is it almost seems like a tangent. He starts talking about Moses. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all those oppressed in verse 6. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. That is a refrain. Verse 8 is a refrain. It's on the front of your bulletin. It is a refrain that is found throughout the Old Testament. And one of the first times we hear it, if not the first place we hear it, is Exodus 34. What happens around Exodus 34? This is just after Israel has blown it big time. Think back, think back in the Old Testament story. God hears the cries of his people in Egypt. He brings them out of Egypt with a powerful hand and then gives Moses the law. And Moses comes down from the mountain with the, with the commandments. And what do the people do? They, they've been waiting patiently and receive it with joy? No. Moses finds that they've made a golden calf because they've been impatient. They've blown it as God's people just after God has rescued them in a powerful way and shown his hand and his love towards them. And it's after this we hear this refrain after this. And this is so important for us to grasp and to get. It's after this we hear this refrain. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Even heinous sin does not erase God's willingness to forgive us from that sin. Do we get that? Because when it comes to Israel's history, you look through the Old Testament and even later as people reflect on the Old Testament, that is the sin par excellence. Some of the later rabbis in the Talmud, they, they even go as far to exaggerate and say that anything bad that's ever happened to Israel is at least in part to be blamed on this incident with the golden calf way back in Exodus. I don't believe that. But it goes to show you how serious that sin was. Yet, right afterwards, how does God reveal himself to Israel? As the one who is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love.
let me ask all of us. And it's a question that we have to look inwards. And it's a question we have to ask as we look outwards. Are there certain sins that are too bad? Are are there things that we think that God won't forgive us of? Or maybe we think, oh, you know, those sins out there, I don't commit those, but, you know, those really bad people do that. And those are just the kind of things that God doesn't forgive. No. God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. We need to remember that. We need to remember it for ourselves and we need to remember it with compassion as we look on the people around us. People in our lives, people we see, things we hear about. Who is the God we worship? Psalm 103 verse 8 tells us. But the psalmist isn't finished there, and he starts unpacking what this means. The psalmist is not content with just a kind of vague notion of God's nature, as good as he's described it already. And he, again, two things God won't do. He will not always accuse, verse 9, nor will he harbor his anger forever. And he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. In verse 9, he will not harbor his anger. In Leviticus, that same word talks about bearing a grudge. Interestingly, in Song of Songs, the same verb is used to talk about tending a vineyard. So it means to take, either positively or negatively, take care of something or cultivate something to tend to something or to nurse it. And the image that came in my mind as I I reflected on this word and as I reflected on this imagery is, is, is somebody who is a wine connoisseur and they had their, their, their very valuable vintages just being stored up and cherished in their basement, in their wine cellar. And sometimes I think we can think of God like this in the utmost negative extreme. We think of God as, as, a, as an anger connoisseur. And his, his, his anger cellar is just filled with bottles of his anger. And he's tending them, or attending to them and cultivating them and preserving them and just waiting for the right occasion to open them and, and release it upon us. But what does our psalm say? He won't always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. God is not a God of karma. He doesn't treat us the way we deserve or repay pay us according to what we have done. Just think about that for a second. Let the, or put that on the back burner as we go to three positive statements on God's forgiveness. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love. Again, God's covenant love, that word again shows up. For those who fear him. So that's the first thing. And I love this one. And when the kids were little, and sometimes we still say it to them, we love you to the moon and back. That's what God's saying to us. His love for us is to the moon and back. And it's like the psalmist is just heaping the imagery of what and the truth of who God is, one thing on top of another here. As far as the east is from the west, So far has he he removed our transgressions from us. Let me ask you this, and don't answer out loud, please. What are you ashamed of in your life? 
attitudes you've had, things you've done, things you've said. Maybe you've insulted somebody. Maybe you've been a jerk. At one time or another, we all have. What's your greatest fear when you think of those things in your life? I would say my greatest fear would be for someone to rub those things in my face, to remind me of those things, to hold them against me. What does the psalmist say? As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. And if those two points weren't good enough, again, the cherry on top of the Sunday, as a father has compassion on his children, so Yahweh has compassion on those who fear him. Another question for you, how would you respond to your own child, or really any child, if they've come to you and they've expressed genuine remorse for their actions, they've recognized the error of their ways, and they're truly sorry for what they've done and they've asked for your forgiveness? How would you respond? Bitterness? Vindictiveness? Uh, How could you? Or would it be with love and mercy and thankfulness that they recognize the error of their ways? The psalmist tells us very clearly what God's disposition to us is when we come to him seeking his forgiveness. As a father has compassion on his children, the same word that was used earlier, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Why is God like this? The psalmist tells us. Verse 14, he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and is gone, and its place remembers it no more. This is very similar to the, the concept that's going on in Isaiah 40. I encourage you to read that chapter later. So why is God like this? In a sentence, if we want to summarize verses 14 through 16, it's this. God knows us. He knows what we're made of, if you will. You remember Jesus' words on the cross according to the Gospel of Luke? Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, is the psalmist... And Jesus, are they saying that we're not culpable for our sins, that we're not responsible for our sins? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But what, but what the psalmist and Jesus are saying is that there is a sense, a very real sense, that we are blinded by our own sin and ignorance. And God knows how much we need his forgiveness, his grace, his help in order to get where we need to go. In order to be the people that God has called us to be, we need his forgiveness. We need his grace. We need his compassion in our lives. Because we are fragile and so susceptible to do with doing things our way rather than doing them God's way. God knows this. The psalmist knows this. Jesus knew this. 
May we know this. And just so there's no mistaking it, if, if we haven't gotten it already, notice the contrast between our fragile, unfaithful, fickle ways and God's way in verses 17 and 18. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love, there's that word again, his faithfulness, is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children and with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his, his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. A number of things come from these verses. First is this. God's love, his faithfulness, his loyalty, his steadfast to us, his steadfastness to us is not fickle. It's forever. It's loyal. It's not up and down like we are. Second thing, we're not talking about cheap grace. The response to God's grace and the response to his mercy and his compassion not least of which includes his forgiveness is to have a holy respect of the one who has forgiven us and to live a life of faithfulness and obedience to God's ways there are a million ways that we could think about this but in light of our passage, forgiveness comes to mind. Jesus taught his disciples to pray a very dangerous prayer. You remember what he said in the Lord's Prayer? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's a dangerous prayer. God, forgive me the same way that I've forgiven that person who's treated me pretty badly. Forgive me, Lord, the same way that that person over there, how I've forgiven them. Forgive me just like that. It's dangerous. But in light of God's extravagant forgiveness. How can we not forgive those who have trespassed against us? Another thing I think we want to keep in mind as we look at Psalm 103 is this. Yes, this is obviously an Old Testament passage, but the basis for God's forgiveness here and anywhere else in Scripture is the cross. Jesus' death on our behalf on the cross is where God identified with us. And on the cross, Jesus, Jesus willingly took the burden of our shame and our sin upon us. Paul put it this way. In 2 Corinthians, God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Wow. That is powerful, powerful stuff. The God of the universe became sin and was judged in our place so that we might be forgiven. And in light of this incredible forgiveness, how can we not echo with the psalmist, bless or praise the Lord, you his angels? It's like the psalmist just explodes now. It's not just people he wants to respond, but everything in God's creation. You his angels, you his mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Bless or praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. 
as we close this morning, let me ask you, do you need to be reminded of the nature of God's forgiveness? If so, look over this psalm again. Let the, the imagery and the truths that are heaped one upon another saturate your soul. And remember that the Lord is gracious and compassionate. As far as the east is from the west, and he, his sins, our sins have been removed, and he doesn't treat us as we deserve. And thank, thank God for that. Is there something for which you need God's forgiveness? Acknowledge it to God and ask him for the help and the wisdom to make it right. And if you've never even thought about God's forgiveness this morning, if that hasn't even been on your radar, and you're maybe thinking about it for the first time, let me assure you, we are all in the same boat. We all need it. Jesus said he came not for the healthy but the sick. And here's the rub. We're all sick. We all need Jesus. And that first step is recognizing and acknowledging to God that we are sick. We need his forgiveness. We need his healing. We need him to lift us out of the pit. And the good news of the kingdom of God is that Jesus is the good king. If I can borrow from last week, the good shepherd. And his kingdom is one of forgiveness. And when one of 100 sheep go astray, the shepherd, the king, goes after that one sheep, leaving the 99 behind. And there's a party in heaven when that sheep is found and responds and comes back with the shepherd into the fold. That's God's forgiveness. He welcomes us back. Indeed, he pursues us so that we will come back. Indeed, bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all of his benefits. Father, we thank you this morning that you are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Help us to respond to that grace and forgiveness. And may our, may our hearts and our lives burst with gratitude as the psalmist did. For your disposition and your graciousness to us. Help us to help us to do that this week, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.